So welcome back. Thank you so much for, for coming and thank you to a wonderful group of panelists who are here this afternoon for our next session. And the next um, session is going to look at new understandings of what constitutes risk and resilience in the health sector, in the broader health sector, and the role of preventative strategies to secure the health of the future. So I'm going to bring onto the stage um, a number of, of our um, experts. Can I first of all welcome Professor Srenath Reddy, who is the president of the Public Health Foundation of India. And then to welcome Mark Gordon from the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. And Mark was head of the um, Global Risk Analysis and Reporting Unit and the head of the, the Sendai Framework Monitoring Unit. Also, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. John Kangasong, who is the director of the Africa Centre for Diseases Control. We will be joined by um, Professor Annalise Wilder-Smith in a few minutes. And, but I'll let me introduce the chair of the panel today. And the panel is going to be chaired by our very own Professor Lisa Bowden, who's a professor of population medicine and veterinary health policy at our Global Academy for Agriculture and Food Security. So Lisa, can I welcome you to the stage and thank you. Joining in, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I want to welcome you to this session, which is on what constitutes risk and resilience in the health sector and the role of preventative st strategies to secure health in the future. I'm really delighted to be joined by this, uh, such an esteemed panel who I hope are going to be drawing out some of the tensions and potentially contradictions between the security and the sustainability agendas in this discussion. So just to start, um, I just want to introduce the idea that prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, there's perhaps been insufficient consideration of how global health security and sustainable uh, development in agendas interact, and perhaps therefore also an implicit assumption that actions for one might also be advantageous to the other. But these uh, agendas aren't necessarily aligned. Uh, the risks, the bearers of those risks, and the, the risk mitigation activities and strategies are likely to be different in each, and they may also be in conflict. Um, our aim in this conversation is to consider and also critically evaluate how we ourselves as individuals within our universities, our national and international agencies and partner organizations can work together to respond not just to the current health risk of COVID-19, but also to consider how we can improve preparedness for the future uh, health, uh, global health risks and emergencies without neglecting progress towards the sustainable development goals. And with that, I'd like to um, uh, kick off by um, posing my first question to Mark Gordon. Um, we have a short amount of time in the session and I'm keen to, to draw on everyone's expertise. Mark, um, can you comment on how you think COVID-19 has reframed how we think about risks and who carries that burden of risk? And indeed, is there a need to develop a culture of prevention in the way that we want to think about and live with risk? Just to reflect deeply, the uh, I can summarize this, the transparency of proximity and the transparency of immediacy. Um, COVID has forced us all individually and collectively to uh, reflect very deeply on, on many of the things that underpin a functioning society, how we organize, how we interact and how we collaborate. Uh, it's pushed us to re-examine and redesign some of the constructs that define how we conduct research, how we educate, we develop knowledge, make decisions, perhaps invest, um, to the point of shaping or be shaped by capital. Um, it's really caused us all to reflect very deeply on the very nature of individual and collective responsibility through the choices that we make, if we are able to make those choices, indeed those lifestyles that we lead. Uh, I suspect that we will take this forward, but it's uh, it's also caused us, and I heard Dr. Fauci referring to this earlier in the, uh, in the conversations around his fervent hope for us to be able to learn from our experience. Uh, because of course, the, the pandemic that we are currently navigating and will continue to navigate for some time, if not ever, um, these realities exist because 
and to paraphrase Gilbert White, we did not do better with what we knew or what we know. And a series of decisions about ways to reduce risk <coughs> were not followed. I suspect you'd like me to stop there, but I could happily carry on. Well, I'd like to pick up on something you just said there um, about uh, uh, how we're how we try to design systems for those who are able to make choices. Um, I want to bring in uh, Professor Wilder Smith or Wilder Smith. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, do you think that resilience is possible in a health system where there is potentially no equity or equality? Uh, resilience obviously is driven by, by many factors, but, but inequity is one factor that really makes um, uh, that really is needed <laughs> to to address uh, a resilience. So so and and the COVID nineteen pandemic has has really unravelled the the risk of inequity, uh, and and even within high income countries. So in the U S, for example, where there is even no universal health coverage, those without health coverage could not comply, for example, with the pandemic response of non-pharmaceutical interventions. They had to continue living in densely populated areas or had to continue to work and were not covered by health coverage to actually uh, be allowed to go for testing or even wanting to be tested because they knew they would be quarantined or isolated if they were tested positive or contact. So they would try to hide uh, any, uh, any illness. So, and we know that any kind of source of infection will propagate uh, the pandemic. So yes, inequity is, is, a, is, a, is a tenant of, of resilience. And, and I think this, this pandemic has even shown it more, and even with, and that's important, and even within high income countries. And do you want to comment just a little bit further, and I can, um, and I can bring Mark back into this conversation as well, about um, what you think some of the strategies are to deal with those inequities? And I'll, 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 I'll pause there and just let you respond. So, so indeed, the government and, and the US did that, and many other governments did that, is, is to now proactively um, make sure that there is access, for example, to testing, but enabling a testing as well by paying for the tests, by ensuring that there is some kind of continued salaries during a time of enforced isolation or enforced quarantine if you are in, if you are, if you are in contact. Um, and also ensuring that there, is, uh, that there is a lower threshold for example, to get to get um, hospitalized. So from 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 New York, you've seen the scenes where people, um, especially of, of minorities or the black communities, delayed being being uh, being admitted to hospitals because they had to pay out of pocket. And and we know that if you delay, then you have a higher risk of severe disease outcomes. And and there have been many just dying, just waiting to get in. So so I think it it had uh, major implications. Thank you. Mark, just a quick comment from you, um, if you wanted to, to respond to, to that. Um, yes, quick. Uh, I will be. Lots to say, but um, I, I take a, a, a more macro view in looking at it from the point of view of, yes, COVID, but more broadly, global health resilience or even human and ecosystems health and well-being. Fundamentally, unless we revisit deeply the values that we hold as societies in terms of what we value and how we value that. Uh, I think that this is going to be an enormous challenge uh, to our ability to be able to have equitable distribution of, yes, healthcare, uh, but of uh, our very ability to exist as humans in nature as opposed to humans and nature. And I can elaborate on that later on. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'll come back to that because uh, I want to pick up on what you just said about value because I think it links into um, the next conversation about what we mean by a resilient health sector. And um, I'm interested to hear from Professor Reddy and, uh, um, and Dr. Uh, Kingasong about how they think a health sector should be, if you like, valued, um, what parts of that health sector are important to promote, and what do we mean by resilience in, in the sense of um, how do we make that health sector agile and uh, flexible so that it can respond to future threats? I'll come to um, Dr. Uh, Nick Kingasong first, please. Yeah, no, thank you. The, um, th this is a very interesting topic, of the, the whole topic of risk, which um, if you take a macro level uh, uh, or bird's eye view of risk, I mean, it, it says that uh, or it speaks to uh, that something bad will happen. 
And then, of course, if, uh, they, that if you speak to that possibility, then you also speak into the fact that there's uncertainty. So for the longest, we knew that uh, at, at COVID, something like COVID might occur. I don't align the word might occur uh, because we had all the indicators. I mean, over the last uh, uh, 50 years, you, if you map the emergence of diseases, especially in Africa, where uh, I, I sit, I mean, we've seen the emergence of Ebola, Marburg, uh, uh, HIV AIDS and others. It was clear indication that uh, some, there's a risk that something big will happen and, and it has happened. I think that is that. Now the question becomes, how do we, um, speaking to your question, have developed resilient systems? I've always argued that at least from where I sit, as the saying goes, your, your stand <clears throat> on any issue is where you sit is mm -hmm. that you should actually uh, be uh, doing the uh, uh, strengthening of systems to address the current challenges in a manner that when you, you are faced with uh, a risk uh, uh, emerging like or new diseases emerging like COVID, you can actually use those same systems to fight them, okay? And, and not necessarily build separate systems that will be uh, waiting for, uh, will be resilient enough to fight uh, new out outbreaks. Uh, I mean, so what do we mean by this? If we have a, a strong workforce, okay, at different layers of the community, that we are applying them to fight the, the challenges that we face every day on the continent, like HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the challenges of immunization. If we can produce vaccines locally, to fight in existing diseases and not import 99% of our vaccines and drugs outside of the continent, then you have resilient systems that when you are challenged with these new viruses or new death, uh, disease threats, you can apply them very quickly to addressing them. That, that is what I would see from where I sit as being a, having a resilient system. But I look forward to um, really uh, expanding on this or debating on this further. Yeah, I want to uh, just pick on something, uh, pick up on something you said. So um, it's this tension really between uh, local solutions um, that are culturally appropriate solutions um, where you're developing self-sufficiency at, at an individual level, but also at regional and community levels and then building to a national level. But that also has to then link um, between in, in a systemic way um, internationally. So you have to have local resilience is what I've heard you say, and, uh, but international connectedness at the same time. Um, it, perhaps just a reaction to that. Um, and then I, I might bring in Professor Reddy to see um, what his experiences are in India. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think you, 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 you capture it so nicely. I think uh, uh, also we need to step back and be uh, humble enough to say that we need to couch out uh, a, a new uh, public health security architecture. That speaks to the global governance of that. That also speaks to the regional governance and speaks to the local governance of, of, of it and management along the... So what do we mean by this? Okay, it means that you need a strengthened and empowered WHO. You need mm -hmm. regional bodies like the CDCs of the European CDCs, the Africa CDCs, the PAHO to be strengthened and empowered. And you have you need local, national public. And that way you function as a network and not centralize your, your, your health uh, security response apparatus. It will be like having a country like United States or the UK and you have only one military base that is operating out of London and you are expecting that you can protect uh, the nation of about 60 something million people. I think we have to reason in, in that uh, uh, dimension for our own health security as a, as a, as a world. Thank you. Um, Professor Reddy, um, comments on that and, and um, be interested to hear your perspective. I agree that there is a clear relationship between national health systems and also the global connectivity and they cannot be divorced. At the national level, we need a well-resourced, well-functioning health system in the steady state to provide a swift and strong surge response when a public health emergency strikes you. You cannot scamper to implement ad hoc solutions with any level of efficiency and equity. And therefore, that health system has to be actually developed on the principles of primary 
care-led universal health coverage, data-driven decentralized decision-making. And I fully agree that it needs to be as decentralized as possible with policy-making at the central level, planning at the regional level, but definitely flexible implementation at the local district level. But we also need people-partnered public health. You cannot have engagement that it is overcoming the vaccine resistance or whether it is getting people to get tested readily you need it to be a people connected area but at the same time at the global level we need global solidarity based on shared values not just shared vulnerability and that shared value is actually going to underlie that solidarity in real terms not merely in rhetoric. And there, for example, South Africa and India have jointly introduced a resolution for bringing in greater TRIPS flexibilities for providing greater access to technologies, medicines, and vaccines. Now, it is that kind of access that is needed to cope competently and compassionately with a global pandemic. Will the world respond? We'll have to wait and see. Thank you. Um, I, I'm very interested. I, I think it picks up nicely, actually, where Mark uh, sort of uh, began, which is around here about this concept of shared values. And um, and again, thinking about this is scaling up from local values up to international values. Um, I'm curious about whether when we're talking about global health, we're talking about health um, or we're talking about well-being and how that fits into the uh, context of the sustainability agenda. Um, I just maybe just throw that out to all um, for a moment and just uh, just to have some reaction. Would you like to come in, uh, Professor Wilderson? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, in fact, you know, I work as consultant for, for WHO and, and uh, at the time when we did not yet have vaccines, we decided that we need to th think through the values that would underpin decisions on vaccine prioritization and vaccine allocation for equitable distribution between countries, but also within countries. In fact, within countries is, is as difficult as, in, as, as between countries. And you can already see now people using their social standing or economic power to skip the queue, although we exactly know who is at higher risk group. Anyway, we, we identified six core values. And one is, of course, the equal respect that to recognize and treat all human beings as equal, uh, as having an equal moral status and their interests as deserving equal moral a consideration. We also had reciprocity, so honoring obligations to people who serve us in a society. That's the frontline workers, the healthcare workers, the police, but also the, the, the principle of legitimacy. That means we need to have transparent processes that are evidence-based, shared with affected communities, uh, and that and we are held accountable for when we make decisions on, on, on vaccine prioritization and vaccine allocation. And, and I think, and we published these values framework, these, these, these six core values, which included also um, human well-being, as you said, and, um, and, and, and equity. Uh, and we used those six core values to underpin 11 public health objectives that then formed a prioritization roadmap. And indeed, mm -hmm. many countries are following it. But we also mm -hmm. see that in many countries, it's the politicians first, it's the rich first, <laughs> etc., or even the sports people first, or the travelers, rather than those at highest risk. So holding us accountable to sticking to predefined, before the vaccine arrived, predefined criteria for prioritization is very important. Yes, and I think um, that I suppose I'd like to move that along by, by um, bringing that back into what Professor Reddy said um, about the, the, the fact that we can't do uh, most things in emergencies. You have to have this where we, we move from pandemic and there's a pre-pandemic and post-pandemic status that we're always in in terms of readiness. And I saw that Mark had his hand up. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, hand over to you, Mark, for a quick comment on that. And then we'll probably have our, our last question because time's moving on. Mark. Thank you. Now, I, I'm looking at the title of the session. I would like I try to encourage us also to consider this from a risk perspective. Um, mm -hmm. What we're talking about here is fundamentally important for navigating this particular phase of the pandemic in terms of 
uh, how can we be better prepared for a more effective response once the risk is realized, which is you know, what is happening now. But uh, I would hope that part of the lessons le that we learn through this uh, is also to really think ex ante, really think upstream about what are the preventative measures that we can undertake to try and understand what are the fundamental uh, causal factors and root drivers of risk. Uh, the, this particular pandemic um, emergency is is systemic in nature, and it's uh, we've seen this in the way in which it's uh, it's be, it's manifested across trade, food, energy, transportation, social systems. Um, it is a disaster that impacts all, but it's these very same systems that created the conditions for the virus to emerge, propagate, and to become a global catastrophe in the first place. And so it really prompts us all to think very deeply about uh, many of these aspects that fundamentally drive the creation and propagation of risk so that if we can be informed and more intelligent about anticipating future shocks, we can actually deal with those risks before they are created or reduce those that currently exist before it manifests as a shock. Uh, and the next uh, shock may well be uh, distinctly more horrifying than this one. Thanks, Mark. I mean, I think what's interesting about that is that this has been characterized as a health risk, when in fact what you're saying here is that it is um, a multilateral risk that um, probably from the outset we might need to have leadership across all of those sectors in order to be able to tackle it. My last question to everybody, just as time is running out, and um, I want to end on a, an optimistic note. And um, you know, this has been a, a difficult period of time for a, a lot of people. Um, what, what do you think um, after this, where the opportunities might lie? And I, I'll start with Professor Reddy, um, just in a word or two, where you think the biggest opportunities for you in your country lie? I believe that we have now begun to recognize <clears throat> the value of science-led public health because the speed of science globally, as well as in India, has provided strength and momentum to the public health response. And we've also seen how multi-sectoral coordination is absolutely important for providing an effective response. And I certainly believe that reductionist disjointed responses will have to give way to well-concerted, much more multi-sectoral responses, because even if the spectrum of science is reductionist in content, it is holistic in context. And that is the lesson I believe the world should take from the pandemic. Thank you. Um, Dr. King is on. I think the, the, um, what has clearly emerged from this pandemic is the, how science how, uh, can be used in, in resolving the challenges of our time. And uh, to just to imagine that within uh, 14 months when this virus was identified to the time we are having a needle in somebody's um in the in the, in the spirit of vaccination is truly amazing uh those who fought the 1918 pandemic didn't even know what they were doing for many years the vaccine against um, the, the spanish flu will only be available in the 30s when this the pandemic was way over here we are with, within a few weeks knowing what the virus is developing a diagnostic test and within a year, put a, a, a needle in somebody's arm. I think that speaks to how uh, science has evolved. And if we harness that positively and be in the right mind frame of sharing that experience and building capacity regionally, then we can better prepare for the future. Thank you. Uh, Professor Wilder-Smith. I think it has underpinned the need and urgency for universal health coverage. And I think that's what we should focus on in the post-pandemic period. Thank you. That's nice and succinct. Thanks. Um, and uh, Mark, this is the last final thought to you before we um, uh, speak to Liz. So, yes, I, I would uh, echo many of the statements made earlier. And for us to be able to move forward with humility in terms of recognizing what we don't know, uh, that uncertainty is a fundamental feature of how we are going to chart our way forwards in better understanding the systemic nature of risk and how we position ourselves to be able to uh, avoid its creation or mitigate its, uh, its propagation before it realizes in moving forward. Science, of course, is a fundamentally important part of that, but uh, the scientific method also can be accused of um, 
simplifying complexity by removing it from context. And I think that this notion of uh, utilizing all the capabilities at our disposal to explore different ways of knowing uh, that encourage transdisciplinarity, that uh, allow us to uh, better understand contextual and relational information uh, so that we recognize the, uh, the specificities of, of the scenario that we're trying to deal with. And I think that that is something that is coming forth out of this crisis as increasingly being recognized so that we can become more comfortable in living with uncertainty as we move forward. I think that's a really nice place to stop. Um, the future is about uh, learning how to become more comfortable with uncertainty. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of you uh, very much for sharing your expertise. It's been a real pleasure to have this conversation with you. And I think uh, Liz is going to join um, us now to give a vote of thanks. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. That was a fascinating conversation. Fascinating because it um, picked up so much of the previous um, the first two discussions that emphasize emphasis on the importance of public health, the science that tells us what's happening, the importance of equity in actually re recognizing that we have a choice there, um, the importance of primary care. And while you didn't um, use the words specifically, I, I think, Annalise, when you talk about universal health coverage and the need for universal health coverage, it's got to start in the primary care domain. And that's got to be where the steadiness starts. And also that sense of planetary health, of where we go because our world is so interconnected. It's so, um, we, we if we think of COVID as just a, a, a this pandemic uh, about human health, we're wrong. If you think it's just about um, animal health, if you think it's just about economic health, we're wrong. It's about this complexity together. I love what you said around also being much more sensitive to the risks that are there already. How do we, what drives the creation of risk? How do we identify that? How do we learn lessons from the, um, every continent and begin to have a much more collective understanding so thank you i really appreciate it your time thank you so much professor reddy and the insights you have brought from the indian subcontinent thank you uh, mark for that your perceptions on risk and resilience from your work with the un thank you um john from the the insights that you've brought from the african continent of where um you are have got so much knowledge an expertise in CDC and we need to understand that and uh, um, for Annalise Wilder-Smith uh, we really appreciate your insights both from WHO and also as a as an honorary professor um, in Singapore as well and in, in London. Uh, Lisa um, you facilitated and you brought your expertise around One Health so for that I um, want to say we appreciate the time and please do for the global public who are listening please do um respond in add to the the hashtag um edinburgh futures conversation um add comments because the day is about identifying a set of principles of action that we as a university but as we as partners together can take forward um as dr fauci said at the start it's about collective action is about solidarity and Dr. Chong said that and Professor Kloshout said that solidarity together. So to everyone um, if you you can click leave on this session and at five past three you can click on the next session which is the interactive panel session two challenging the new inequalities brought about by the pandemic and the underlying inequalities that the pandemic made explicit and intensified such as those inequalities around health and healthcare access and actually the broader components of health around education around income around well-being so leave this session and remember to click on the the button to take you to your timeline and then click on the next one at five past three thank you again